Hey, folks. Is there anybody on here? Are we rocking? 60 people. Let's see. Can you, you guys hear me? Looks good. Can you hear me? Can you hear this guitar? Does it sound like a guitar amp or does it just sound like a, an electric guitar acoustic? I don't know if, uh, I've never done a live YouTube before, so I don't know if, uh, with a slap delay, uh-oh, shouldn't be, but, okay, great. How's everybody doing? I'm going to move this chat screen over here so uh, that it doesn't look like I'm doing this the whole time. Man, you guys are already being so nice. What the heck? Uh... I want to I want to start by saying a big thank you to my pals at Stringjoy for setting this up. Uh, these guys have been really really good to me over the years and helped me get um, get my string thing happening. Because I think anybody uh, anybody there who kind of knows what I'm all about, you know that I I have to use I don't have to use I choose to use weird strings. I don't think I have a choice. I think I have to put this chat window over on my other monitor. So, um, is that the new tailpiece? Yes, it is. Look at that. And uh, uh, check this out. Oh, it plays in tune, or at least closer to in tune than it than it did, and as it could, because guitars are just innately wicked out of tune so you lost some hair weight bro it's true um too much gain there shouldn't be any gain would you mind describing your string height and gauges for playing slide uh sure let's get right into it let's just do it um right now i'm actually using a slightly lighter set of strings um i i've been saying due to covid hands um just because I'm not playing quite as much. and But what I normally use, um, my high E string is tuned down two full steps to C. So I use an, uh, an open tuning, open C, which is uh, C, G, C, E, G, C, one, one, five, one, three, five, one of the intervals. And um, it's quite low, so I use he really heavy strings. So the top string, normally a 19, and the bottom string has kind of settled in around 64. I was using a 68 for a while, but I watched that Rick Beato video about using lighter strings and I started experimenting with lighter strings. Right now I have, um, I think I have, uh, um, <laughs> Scott would actually know, Stringjoy Scott, uh, 17 to I believe actually 56, which is the lightest I've ever had. And I thought that it was gonna be kind of wimpy, but it's actually, <laughs> it's really, really, really clear. Um, so I think there's actually parts of this this um, this string set that I'm actually going to keep, but um, Scott from Stringjoy is uh, an incredible resource because I could go, man, uh, how is how would this sound? And he would go, ah, uh, you know that that gauge is probably not going to work because of this tension and this core wire and this blah 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 blah. He's really nerdy about that stuff, so he he he's a um, uh, a, a wealth of knowledge and I've, I've leaned on him a lot for picking the strings that I use. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I do, I do like that. Uh, heaviest gauges were a little muddy. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely can get muddy. Uh, the 68 sounds and feels, it definitely feels great, but compared to something lighter, I noticed that it is a little bit like it kind of does have that blanket over the speaker kind of quality. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. So I'm using 17, 19, 22, wound, 32, 44, 56, light gauge. I mean, it's still, it's it's actually kind of. Anyway, it sounds pretty good to me. Um, so um, I kind of thought that we could, uh, we could talk a little bit about some of the things that are important to me musically, talk about a few things slide wise, and then uh, maybe get into the Q and A um, kind of portion, uh, unless you guys just just want to talk questions. That's fine too. But um, 
Oh, you know what, Darren Guitar, you you asked a question here that's going to kind of kick the whole thing off for me. So when you improvise, are you always thinking about intervals against the chord? Um, <clears throat> and I mean, preferably when you're improvising, you're not you're not thinking as much as you're feeling. That's kind of the at least the kind of music that I make. Um, that's where I kind of want to come from. Um, but when I practice, absolutely. So a big part of my sort of approach to the guitar and my my the system that I kind of used to learn the fretboard and open tuning because I like like virtually everyone else I started in standard tuning um, and when I started getting really into slide guitar and other slide guitar players I started to migrate towards open tuning so I exper experimented with open G I experimented in open A um, you know uh, Bonnie Raitt I, I'm pretty sure Bonnie Raitt plays an open G Lowell George played an open G and also open A um, but then there's players like, of course, Derek Trucks plays an open E. Um, I think Dwayne Allman also played an open E, but I don't know that for sure. Somebody, somebody would probably be able to confirm that. Anyway, lots of slide folks uh, gravitate towards those tunings, of course. So I started messing around with that, and I really connected with it. And I really connected with some of the chord voicings that I was able to get. But I, I was really, really frustrated with the fact that I lost all the vocabulary that I had built in standard tuning. Of course, when you change the tuning, nothing is where it used to be. Um, so I kind of, I kind of had this dilemma, like, what do I do? Do I, do I cart around two guitars? What do I do? And I always had a hard time switching back and forth, um, between standard tuning and open tuning. It was always, always take me like a song and a half to remember where I was and stop making like mistakes like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It sounds just like that. Um, so I, I started just kind of asking myself questions uh, like, what do I know? I know that if I bar my finger, I get a major chord. Um, most importantly, I get a root position major chord, which is root three, five, or one, three, five. So if I know that this is one, and I know the formula of the major scale, which is tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, then I should be able to figure out where the next scale tone is up from the one. And then I know where the three is because of the chord. So there's my first three notes of my major scale. And then I know, because I know the formula for the major scale, I know that my four of the scale is a half step below, above, <laughs> below, above the three. And then I know where my five is, again, because of the chord. Six is a full step above. And then here's an interesting thing. You could think of, of course, you can think about the seven as being another whole step above that. But I was thinking, okay, well, I know that I have another root because the tuning is, there. There's, there's a bunch of octaves built into the tuning. And I know that the major seven is a half step below the root. So I, I, that, and that was just kind of the logic that I used to figure things out. Um, and then, you know, if this is my one chord, then I swap the three for a four and the five for a six. There's my four chord, my four chord. And then back from my one chord, if I swap the one, one for a seven, the three for a two, and then the five stays put, then there's my five chord. So just by knowing where that one chord was and what it was made of, I was able to kind of use logic um, and and just a, a truly a basic understanding of the major scale to kind of problem solve my way through where some of these chord shapes were. Matthias, from, uh, in Uruguay, nice to see you, my brother. Um, uh, so, and that kind of sent me on a bit of a trip with with chords and chord voicings and inter, um, inversions and things like that. And it was something that I never actually explored in standard tuning. Um, that. Uh, instead of memorizing the shapes, I was thinking about where they were in relationship to each other. So if the five chord is here, then, you know, then I, I was able to kind of logic my way through where some of these other shapes were instead of kind of going to the internet and trying to find chord diagrams or I, I so the, the series of questions that I was asking myself were what do I know and how can I use what I know to figure out the things that I don't know. And, um, and that really opened up my, I think my my ability to see things musically outside of just the instrument. And as guitar players, I think we we um, we're a very proud bunch. And there's a lot of culture that comes with playing the guitar. Like you don't see the principal oboist from blah 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 symphony orchestra going like, "Hey guys, this is uh, 
Chad Blakerson and I love gauge 14 oboe reads. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a the guitar players have an identity and it's a beautiful thing. Um, but it can also kind of inform how we approach our instrument, myself included. And when I started playing in an open tuning, it might as well have been an oboe. I, the only thing I understood was how the instrument worked. Um, but I didn't know where literally anything was. And again, the only thing I knew was if I bar my finger, that gives me a major chord. So um, that's that's kind of where my my approach kind of started. And I mean, like I know I'm you know I'm not I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but it was a massive revelation for me. So I, I then took that and started to explore chord inversions, just simple inversions. So if this is C major, one three five. And then I go through the, the set of inversions. So that's root position, because the root is in the bottom. First inversion. And then second inversion. So first inversion is when the three's on the bottom. Second is on, when the five's on the bottom. And then back to the 12th fret, the first octave. When I'm practicing things, I always take things from where I start up an octave. I want to make sure that I'm covering... Um, I'm covering everything in between. I, I've also, and when I was in standard tuning, I was found myself spending a lot of time going, well, I know where the, I know what's happening here. And this is, and then I really know what's happening here. I really wanted to try and, uh, um, Chad Blake <laughs> appreciates the shout out word, Chad. Uh, I, I really wanted to kind of expose some of those, um, sort of shadows on the fretboard is kind of how I, uh, um, I refer to it. Um, and somebody saying forced you out of some other habits or licks. Absolutely, um, it was it was not a it was not an overnight thing. It took a long time, but it but it also changed the way I played in standard tuning because I again I would go back to standard tuning and I would start to use some of this same idea. Okay, well if this is my one chord, and I know like you know if you're in the key of C, the one chord is C E and G. The four chord is F F A and C. F is the four, A is the six, C is the root. So then I need to change whatever the nearest note is. So the third of my one chord is a half step away from the root of my four chord. So the three goes up a half step, you know, and, and then, and that's basically like, if you talk to people who are classically trained, that's kind of what somebody would refer to as pretty basic voice leading. As opposed to, so that was one, four, four, five, one. Instead of doing that, uh, I might've gone one, four, four, five, one, which sounds good, but it's not good voice leading. Anyway, um, and there's, you know, these are, these are some, some, some sort of old fashioned rules that are sometimes super cool to break, but also sometimes super hip and very satisfying to follow. So I started exp exploring that and like trying to navigate the fretboard just using inversions of the one chord, four chord and five chord. So I would start to try and improvise melodies in three part harmony. <laughs> I, so I, you know, I, I started working through things like that, and then I started to explore open voice triads, which is a closed voice triad is something like this, where all of the chord voicings are as close together as they can be. So there's nothing in between. The one goes to the next nearest chord tone, which is a three, to the next nearest chord tone, which is a five. And an open voice triad spreads that out. Um, so something like this, for example, that's also just C major, but instead of everything being close together, they're exactly one chord tone apart. So the five is on the bottom now instead of the one, and instead of playing the one, I skip over the one and play the next chord tone, which is a three. And then same thing again, instead of playing the five again, I skip over that to the next chord tone, which is the one. So then we get these, you know, also very satisfying sounds. <laughs> Oops. Uh. And just, again, it was just these simple, simple chords and simple sounds, but they just gave me so much music. So um, that's kind of where I, where I really discovered, I think I really discovered my voice on the guitar, like aside from playing slide guitar, aside from playing in an open tuning, but it was, um, it was accessing music in this way that forced me to be present with it. So there was no like, Here's, and this is how I play this lick. And this, this is because I didn't have any of that because everything was brand new. So 
um, it was it was quite the adventure. And I mean, again, I'll, I'll say it again. When I go back to standard tuning, I take this stuff with me. So it's not like when I play in standard tuning, then I revert to old licks. Well, actually, I kind of do because I don't play enough in standard tuning anymore to really retain anything. Um, but uh, that kind of like desire to be super present um, while playing taught me a lot about music. And it wasn't just the theory, but I think it was the fact that I was actively thinking about what I'm doing and making active decisions musically while I was playing or while I was practicing. Um, and I think there's plenty of, plenty of value in working through patterns and positions and, you know, um, uh, muscle, you know, generating muscle memory. But if you're only relying on those things to improvise, you're going to find yourself going, man, why do I play the same shit all the time? Sorry. Uh, why do I play the, find myself playing the same stuff all the time? Um, and, and for me, you know, doing this whole thing, which was a pretty big commitment, um, w was, was really helpful. And it's also helped my ability to make music on other instruments. Um, when I'm arranging vocal harmonies, I have a way better picture of what's happening musically in my head while trying to create stuff. Um, and I think as guitar players, we, uh, we can look over a lot of that stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I do teach um, online a fair amount and I, I, I often reassure people, listen, like we don't, we're not going to get into really heavy music theory necessarily, unless you want to, um, then I'm always happy to explore new ideas. And, and if there's stuff that I don't know, like, yeah, I want to go out and learn more. Um, but if you have just a basic understanding of these, um, these sort of fundamental ideas, this is a scale, this is a chord, this is how the chord and the scale interact, then you're going to be able to kind of take that and move forward through music with an ability to kind of archive your own ideas. And that's probably one of the most valuable things about learning some of these fundamental things is that um, I can hear something and go, oh, I love that. That's, that's, uh, that's a, five, a five chord, a dominant seven five chord with the seven on the bottom resolving to the first inversion of the one chord which sounds like this. And because I've explored a lot of those sounds myself, when I hear them out in the world, like if I hear something like that on the radio, I recognize it. And then I could go, hmm, I wonder what that sounds like in the key of F or in the key of E or in the key of D flat or whatever. Um, then you can take that idea. And even if you don't know it in that key, you can kind of go, okay, well, if the five chord, uh, you know, here's, here's my five chord in the key of D flat. C sharp. That's a dominant seven. I got the, the seven on the bottom. And then uh, I'm going to resolve that to um, a first inversion one chord where the three's on the bottom. So, that, you know, just by logic, I can kind of figure that out. Anyway, I, I could yammer on and on and on about this. But the main, the main sort of thing is asking yourself questions. <clears throat> You know, and like I said earlier, for me, it was what do I know and how can I use that to expose the things I don't know? But sometimes it could be what sounds cool. And if you stumble on something that doesn't sound cool, start thinking or start asking yourself, like, why doesn't it sound cool? Start exploring that. Hmm, maybe there's a clash between these notes. Um, or maybe the clash between these notes is like super cool sounding. Um, things like that. I don't know. Um, it's definitely worth uh, diving into. So that's kind of that's kind of my basic music theory class. Um, somebody was asking. Um, somebody was asking about an exercise, and I would say the main one. And if there's any anybody um, watching right now who are one of my students, uh, one of my online students. I'm sorry if this is, this is old news for you, but I go through a little exercise where we work through the inversions of the one chord, four chord, and five chord. So here's where our four chord comes in. So the five, so that's kind of the main exercise. And then um, what I, what I do is I start to explore throughout the string set. I really focus on the D, G and B strings first. No particular reason. I, I, I kind of gravitate toward those strings. Those are kind of my home base. Like in standard tuning, the low E and the A string are often our landmark. For me in, in open tuning, the D, G and B strings is, are, are my landmark. Um, so then 
I work through that until I can kind of do it um, comfortably across the fretboard without stopping to think. I might explore some other keys. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll take every bottom note from the whole sequence and then I'll move it up an octave. So then I'm now in another, I'm on another set of strings. And then I'll do the same thing going the other direction. So, so on, so forth. It keeps going. Um, and then I'll do the same thing with open voice triads versus closed voice triads. So instead of it being, then it'll be. Or up an octave. Come on, brain, you can do it. Um, I'll go through as many different sequences that I can kind of, um, I can kind of think of on my own. And, um, and then the other thing that is a really big part of the way I think of things is if, if you want to go through minor chords, instead of taking every major chord and flattening the three, so it's kind of hard in that open position, but I actually go for the relative minor instead. So, uh, oh, Drew P says, I don't understand the difference between open voices and closed voice triads. So a closed voice triad is when everything is as close together as it can be. So it's going to be root, third, and fifth. So there's no, there's no possible chord tone that could fit in between those. They're as close as they could be. So one goes up to the next chord tone, which is three, to the next is five. You could keep going. Seven, nine, 11, uh, oops. Why can't I play that? Oh, 13, uh, yeah, 13. Um, but an open voice triad places some space in between, um, in between the chord tones. So a closed voice root position triad is spelt out one, three, five. And then an open voice root position triad would be spelled one, five, three. So it's 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 about an it's just under an octave and a half instead of being all within basically a fifth. Um, I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule if an open voice triad is always only one chord chord tone in between. Um, I don't have the formal education to know that. Somebody on here might and would be able to uh, clear that up, but. Um, the way I think of an open voice triad is when there's exactly the space of one chord tone before the next one. So instead of going one to the next chord tone, which is three, I'm going to skip the three, go straight to the five. Um, and then from the five, the next chord tone up would, would be the one again. I'm going to skip over that and go to the next chord tone, which is going to be the three. So it's just, it's just a rearranging of the chords. Um, it's not gonna sound fundamentally different. It's just gonna give you a bit of a different flavor. I really love the way that open voice triads or op you know, like any open voice um, chord sounds. Sorry, my strings are settling and I put some new strings on today. are all just open voice triads exploring um, sounds in the one chord, four chord, five chord. I also threw in the two minor chord, so D minor, and also um, G diminished, or B flat diminished, or E diminished, or D flat diminished. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's everything on that kind of topic. Uh, so wait, open voice triad is skipping the next interval and playing the one after. I believe so. I don't want to. I don't want to say that that's a hard and fast rule because I don't actually know if it is. But that's kind of the way that I think about it. Um, do you have to finger pick them, or can you mute strings and strum? Uh, I'm probably not clever enough to mute the strings and strum, but maybe you are. So I, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure somebody can do that. 
to, and maybe depending on the voicing and uh, and of course the tuning because the voicings if you're playing these these chord um, shapes in standard tuning the the shapes are going to be different the sounds will be identical but um, yeah if you're sure there you could yeah um, so that's that's kind of my my system for mapping out the fretboard so I'm always kind of passively aware of where my one four and five are there's so sort of fundamentally important to the kind of music that I make and a lot of sort of contemporary music. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, that's, that's a big part of how I look at the fretboard anyway. Um, and then the next thing that I kind of thought we could talk about would, would be uh, first time we hear you strum. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not big on strumming, you know, unless I'm playing acoustic guitar. Uh, can any guitar be set up like yours or do some run into issues with intonation with the big strings? Um, this guitar ran into some pretty considerable um, issues with intonation because it's a rap tail and rap tails are pretty traditionally hard to intonate or impossible to intonate. Um, um, mojo, Mojo Axe, Mojo Tone, shit, I can't remember. Um, the, the guy who makes um, aftermarket bridges Rap tail bridges. He makes a compensated bridge for standard tuning, but it doesn't work in this tuning mainly because I use a wound third string, and also because I think there's something that happens um, in the tuning that kind of messes things up. I believe again, I don't, I don't really know the science too much behind it, but I know that when I've tried to use compensated bridges for standard tuning and open tuning, it just doesn't work. When I use a straight bridge, Mojo Tone, thanks God. When I used a straight bridge, it was a little bit better, but it's still pretty brutal. When I got up to the 12th fret, everything was kind of all over the place. Like certain chord voicings, I would have to bend notes individually to get them to kind of fit in. Um, oh, Alex Roken says, actually, it's Mojo Axe. I don't know. Who do I trust? I trust you both so much. I think it is actually Mojo Axe. Um, Mojo Tone does make, make cool stuff, but Mojo Axe is a company that makes the bridges specifically, I think. Um, so we actually approached the guy um, from Mojo X to, uh, to, to make us a CNC file. Um, so I took my callings, which is the same scale length as this guitar, and I intonated it as closely as I could. Um, and then I, I actually balanced the intonation at the 12th fret a tiny bit to kind of keep, um, to keep the, the seventh and ninth fret uh, a little better in tune because when it was perfectly in tune at the 12th, the 7th and, and 9th, which is a place that I spend quite a bit of time chording in, just it's like I, I play a lot in this key and in this position. Um, I, uh, I wanted to make sure that it was balanced. So it is actually a tiny bit off at the 12th fret, but that's to allow for everything sort of to average out a little bit better. Tuning on a on a period, tuning in in the Western world is a compromise at best. If we were to think of the harmonic series, like if you listen to this, those pitches, which are which are the all the individual overtones that make up the whole sound of this note, um, they don't tune. Like if you listen to this third, if you were to if you were to hit that with a tuner, it would show up quite flat. Whereas um, this note, which would, which hopefully, if I, my guitar is in tune, should show up on the tuner relatively in the middle. Um, but if you listen to this, if I flatten that a little bit, it actually sounds quite a bit sweeter. So, anyway, the the whole thing is that the intonation will never be perfect, no matter what. Um, it will never be perfect. Uh, so for me, it was just how. How close can I get it so that my ears won't be distracted by how to out of tune it is? So anyways, if you're playing a Strat or something with an, an adjustable bridge, um, like an ABR or something like that, you'll have, a, you'll have an easier time than I did with this. And I tried a bunch of aftermarket adjustable bridges and they, I, just, I just couldn't get over the fact that it didn't sound as good with a solid, um, a, a solid piece of aluminum. Um, Dan Simmons, hey man, how are you? I hope uh, I hope Southern Ontario is treating you well. We're digging into e equal temperament. I mean, I've only scratched the surface. I don't know that much about it. Um, 
Yes, imperfectly made is absolutely right. So anyways, um, that was my sort of trip with this. I literally just got this bridge like two days ago and put it on and intonated it. And it is so nice to at least be closer in tune. And uh, the first time I played above the 12th fret and heard it actually in tune, my ears were like, oh no, it's off. Something's wrong. And then I looked at it on a tuner and was like, oh no, it's that I'm not used to hearing it play in tune up there. So anyway, it's it, and, I, and I think this is the plight of anyone who plays a rap tail, even if you are using a compensated bridge. It's just a struggle, but it just sounds so damn good. And it's, it's that classic thing where tone trumps all practicality um, pretty much ever. So. Um, so the quest for the bridge is over. Yeah, man, it's over. I mean, there's a few things left to do. Um, I think we're actually going to try and manufacture them and sell them to other nerds like me. Uh, so if anybody has a rap tail that wants to play an open, open C, D, or E, I think this should work for you. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as my, my journey with this, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. Um, we, we may make a few different tweaks to the design so that it just looks a little bit sharper. Um, but it's, it's pretty perfect. It sounds amazing. And the other thing is cause my dad actually made me bridge. He just sort of chipped away at a blank and we got to play really well in tune. But when, you know, if you, if you see at the back here, um, the, the E and B strings are like a mile away. They're right at the very back of the bridge. Um, and, uh, um, when we chipped away at the, at the blank bridge, by the time we got it to play in tune, the strings were so much lower, so the, the radius was just gone. So this actually radius, which is also a breath of fresh air, because I've been just been playing sort of compromised bridges since I got this guitar, um, and and that that's just a testament to how much I love this instrument. Because even though there were some pretty significant challenges, I just connect with this guitar so much that it was like I'm willing to I'm willing to play on a radius that's going like this, and I'm willing to play in a tuning that I literally have to bend every single note out of tune, basically past the, tw the 10th fret to get it to work. But it's just, I love this instrument so much. Um, and uh, yeah, so somebody is asking about modes. Do you think about modes like uh, uh, Mixolydian and major minor blues? Um, I mean, I know, I know all that stuff off by heart um, and I understand the concepts very well, but I don't, uh, um, I said this kind of at the beginning, I really try hard not to think about stuff like that while I'm playing. Um, I don't know, maybe I should think more, but um, especially improvising, it's a really kind of emotional and spiritual thing for me. And so, you know, I may, in, in my mind, I, I, you know, I might get a thing that'll go, hey, what does Dorian sound like in this particular moment? And then I might kind of go off on an explorative journey, but I'm not necessarily thinking, okay, I'm playing over the two chord, I must play Dorian. Um, if I'm thinking about anything at all, it would be chord tones. So if I was playing on a, so that's like D minor to C. So uh, what I would probably play would be something like this. just trying to target um i'm really just trying to target chord tones and in one spot there i actually did play mixolydian but i was playing it kind of over the one chord so i don't know i i that that stuff does definitely come into my mind but it's but it's um i mean i guess ideally the idea would be that you have these concepts you know, these theoretical concepts deeply ingrained into your psyche so that you can pull on when you need them, but you're not sitting there going, oh shit, I'm playing Sweet Home Alabama. What mode should I? And then the moment's gone, you know what I mean? So that's that's kind of, and that, and that's where practicing comes in. When you find these, you find these things and these sounds and these ideas that you really love, um, then rehearse the, the nards off of them. Get really, really comfy with the idea. Get comfy with the sound get comfy with modulating the sound, whatever, whatever different things that you can kind of, um, you can challenge yourself to 
understand something better on your instrument so that when it comes time to improvise, you're not having those, you're not having those ideas. But I do understand that like it, it takes work. And if you, if you haven't had the chance to do that work, then you do have to think. So I, I you know, I would, I would say, you know, while you're playing your mindset, if you do find yourself drifting off to, Hmm, what could I try here? Let that be the springboard to an idea and then move away from it. Um, so that you're not sitting there going like, Hmm, now I'll play Mixolydian. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, and that's something that is always happening. Like, a, you know, a, a, like any human, while you're walking down the street, a bajillion ideas comes at you. You have the ability to choose which one you interact with. And you also have the ability to choose how long you interact with it. Um, and I, I remember when, you know, years ago, I was really, really into the melodic minor scale, all the harmony and all the modes that came with that. And I was playing in my dad's band and we, we had a gig and um, I was like, I'm really, I'm really determined to get my head wrapped around um, uh, Lydian dominant, which is the fourth mode of the melodic minor scale, which is a, it's, it's a dominant seven scale with a sharp 11. So it kind of gives you this sound. Uh, uh, let's do, well, let's do this. Um, and I really liked that sound. And I was, I was, you know, I can't even remember what song we were playing. I mean, it was not necessarily appropriate for the material we were playing. And my dad was like, I get what you're doing, but you know, um, the gig is not the place to practice. The gig is the place to play. So work on this stuff. And once, once it's there, then bring it to the bandstand. And that was a pretty powerful moment for me because I was a young guy and I really wanted to like, be flying and playing impressive stuff. But it was a valuable lesson to go like, th these you know, ideas will mature um, when they're ready. And so if you're trying to force ideas out, or and the other thing I was really into was half hole diminished, and which, which tends to have a pretty angular sound and can generate some really wacky sounding stuff. Um, but it was the same thing. I was trying so hard to work this into my playing and it wasn't coming across authentically. And so that, so it just didn't, it wasn't moving to listen to, it wasn't moving to play. And it was just thinking I was practicing essentially. So th th that's kind of my, that's kind of my approach to that. And again, like, it's not that I don't have these ideas while I'm playing or I'm in the middle of the show, but I, I, I do try to keep myself from interacting with those ideas for too long. Like uh, something pops into my head, try this. And I'll go, hey, cool idea, right on. Okay, I'm gonna do that. And then I move away. So um, let's talk about some slide guitar. Mini Marks, how the heck are you? Everybody go and, uh, go and follow Mini Marks um, if you don't already. Um, she is a wonderful, wonderful musician from Australia. She's a good bud of mine. And uh, you should go check her music out. It'll blow you away. Um, slide tips. Um, not probably won't be that surprising for you guys um, after all the things that we've talked about. But something that I think is super, super uh, valuable for playing slide is navigating um, navigating. Uh, common sounds with the slide on. So it's, you know, I think everybody, myself included, wanted to wanted to get right away to like the, you know, that, whoa, that kind of thing. Um, but what really, what really took me with the slide was how expressive you can get um, uh, with in between things you know, in between the notes, like you, you could, you could make an argument for microtonal playing, but it's not like, uh, you know, just like the, the sort of theory stuff I was talking about before. It's not like I'm looking at this going, Hmm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play, I'm going to play flat five and a half. But in, in my head, that sounds better than, that. and there's something cooler about that kind of thing. So I found myself really exploring those things. And it's not just like sort of microtonal stuff, but it's also just like. There's my melodic minor again. <laughs> I 
that kind of stuff. Like I just love, I love how that sounds and it's really fun to play. And, you know, again, I said earlier, but music is very emotional. It's very spiritual for me. And so, um, you know, I want to move myself and, and, and I want to be able to feel stuff while I'm playing. And that's the kind of stuff that really makes me feel, um, when I'm, when I'm playing, you know, step on a fuzz pedal and it's going to make you feel something different, but you're still, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always like, I'm a big nerd. I love thinking about theory, love talking about it. I love teaching it. I love learning new things. I love people asking me questions. I don't know the answers to. Um, but at the end of the day, all of that stuff is dust. Um, if there's no music coming from it. So that's that to me. And that's what drew me to the slide guitar. I mean, I grew up um, with the last name Landreth and uh, Sonny Landreth was a massive um, hero of mine, but I deliberately avoided playing slide guitar because I was like, why should I even bother <laughs> if there's a guy like him who's got the same name? Um, but I, I mean, I did learn a lot of Sonny Landreth licks when I was growing up and, um, but I never really, I never really let myself go into slide guitar until I heard Derek Trucks. And uh, when I heard all of that sacred steel stuff that Derek was doing, um, which then I, I, I then learned later that um, about people like Aubrey Gent, Aubrey Gent Jr., uh, the Campbell brothers, uh, and, and, and so many great um, steel players that came out of the gospel church that were doing all that stuff first. Um, I mean, there's a record, I think it's called Aubrey Gent and Friends. And it's, I can't remember when it was recorded. It's pretty old. My God, some of some of the greatest slide playing of that style. And then Aubrey Gent's son, Aubrey Jr., uh, AJ, AJ Gent, he is another person that if you're not following him on Instagram and listening to his records, you're making a big mistake if you love that kind of playing. Um, anyway, so I'm really, I was really drawn to that stuff because it's so expressive. Um, but conversely, somebody like Jeff Beck, who does a lot of that like really expressive stuff using whammy bar, it's kind of the same thing. It moves me the same way. Um, there's just something so emotional. And I, I hesitate to necessarily use the word vocal because it's not only vocal. Definitely, 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 that's a big part of it. Um, that it kind of gives you that vocal quality, which makes it sound superhuman, like not superhuman, but very human, um, which the guitar can definitely shy away from, which is super cool. Like you can make it sound like, I mean, geez, you can make it sound like so many different things, but also being able to come back and um, turn it into this incredibly organic human thing is, is really, uh, is, is really beautiful. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was just busy listening to myself talk. <laughs> um, there's some great questions here. Struggle with compartmentalize. Hey, Sonny, how are you, brother? Another friend of mine from Toronto. Um, oh, man, I lived in Toronto for just under four years. And I just heard that the Orbit Room closed. Man, that was a legendary spot. Legendary spot. I had some incredibly, um, incredibly magic moments in that in that place. Struggle with compartmentali compartmentalizing practice time because I want to learn songs, improve chord knowledge, improve my funk strumming, learn diminished, and, and I get lost. Any tips on dividing time better? Make yourself a to-do list. That's something I'm, I'm if I don't have a to-do list, I get lost in my own, um, in my own sort of shuffle. So um, if you're going to sit down and practice and say, okay, I've got, I've got 90 minutes to practice, then give yourself, give yourself a little workout in, in 15 minute chunks. And what's really, really important is make sure you have time to have fun. Like don't just beat yourself over the head. Um, I mean, not that, not that being hard on yourself isn't important, but if you're, if you're so hard on yourself that you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're going to, you're going to miss, um, you're going to miss the, the important stuff, which is playing music is great. It's super fun. It's such a privilege. I'm very grateful I get to do it for a living. Um, so when I practice, I might I might say, you know, I mean, this is all I do for a living. Um, I do teach and I do also session work. So I have to split that up. But when I have days that are full and I'm going to practice or songwrite, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to write. I'm going to write songs with my brother for three hours, or I'm going to write songs with a friend for three hours. I'm going to practice for this long, and in that practice time, I'm going to spend, you know. 25% of the time doing metronome stuff, 25% of the time doing fundamental things like arpeggios, 
scale patterns, maybe a little bit of transcription, something like that. And then the other 50% of the time, I hope that math works out. It's like uh, South Park, half, half man, half bear, half pig. He's 150%. Um, but the, the remaining time that's left, I just explore. So I might, um, I might do kind of stuff like I did at the beginning, like chordal, chordal sort of um, improvising or, um, you know, one thing that I really love to do is just pick a spot on the neck, play one or two notes, and then just see where it goes. Like if I, I'll keep it in, in the key of C so I can take advantage of this low, low string, but, or screw it, I'll do it, I'll do it in D. Just, just to prove that I can play in other keys. <laughs> so if I start on a D, so I'll do like. things like that. And I just sort of explore. And it's not about, it's not about not making mistakes. Um, it's, it's about making mistakes and interacting with them and going like, Hey, how, how do I fix that? Or what is that? That was cool. What a happy accident. It's, it's, it's about having those. Um, it's about having those, uh, those moments um, and, and problem solving within them. So, you know, um, I know a lot of people who's like, they make a mistake and they get mad, they get upset. Uh, they're hard on themselves. They criticize themselves, whatever. Man, that's the whole point. Like for me, um, improvising like that, especially on stage, is like such a thrill because you don't know, man. It, like it, you might fall flat on your face. And then, and then the fun is like, how do I get myself out of this pickle? Like I had a moment um, at the end of one of our last tours where I, I'd, I'd had this moment in the set where I just, I started to improvise harmonically. And, and I think it was in the solo set. And I was playing in, I think I was playing a song in the key of E flat. And I just kind of closed my eyes and started making stuff up. And I, and I was really enjoying it. And then when I looked, when I kind of came to and looked at the fretboard, I had modulated to the key of E, which is not physically far from E flat, but it's quite harmonically far from E flat. To change keys by a half step, it, there's there are next to no notes in common, um, very few that are kind of like can harmonically get you out of hot water. So it was like, shit, <laughs> I got to get back to E flat. I've got a capo on the song that I'm playing. I'm depending on a lot of open strings. So I can't just like, I can't just move up because um, the whole thing falls apart. So what, what do I do? And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I was, I was doing like, oh, my tuner's on. I was playing something like, and so I'm here. And then I think I just went, just did a secondary dominant into the back into the key of E flat. So secondary dominant is when you're when you're when you use the five chord of wherever you're going. So like uh, a, two, a two major is a secondary dominant to the five chord because in this key F major is the five of B flat, which is the five of F. So um, so I was like. I have no, I have no graceful way to get back to the key of E flat. So I'm just going to do it. And it was, you know, just sort of going from E major to E flat in like a bar is kind of like going, you know, a hundred kilometers an hour down the highway and stomping on the brakes. So anyway, um, that, that was fun. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at some questions. Do you use a compressor with slide? Uh, sometimes I do. It's not a big part of my sound though. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, lots and lots and lots of players do. Uh, Lowell George obviously was a massive compressor using guy, um, having two 1176 side chained into each other or one side chained into the, into the next. So his sound was super compressed. Sonny also uses a compressor. I believe, I believe his compressor of choice, at least last I heard was a Dynacomp. And I think he even leaves it in the effects loop of his amp. That was another thing I heard, but I don't know if that's confirmed. Um, but I don't, I definitely do every now and then when I want to try and get that Lowell George sound. Um, but it's not a big part of my, my thing. Like I really like to be able to control the dynamics and, um, all the wonderful things that a compressor brings you. It does kind of take away your ability to, 
um, control the dynamics. And uh, I mean, uh, you can of course have them so that they're not set to absolutely stun. Um, but it kind of defeats the purpose of me for that sort of classic slide guitar tone. You know, that to me, the Lowell George sound is like when your compressors are set to stun and you get that forever sustain. Um, and that's super cool. But the thing that you lose is the ability to kind of, you know, change the way the note feels with your, with your hands. Um, in these days I'm trying to learn some of your solos to know some cool chord shapes and I'm trying to get out some solos. Sweet, man. Uh, good luck. Let me know if I can help at all. Um, would you say ear training is fundamental to everything? Learning a lot of theory now, but still struggle to make music. I think ear, ear training is probably the most important thing. Um, and you can use the things that you um, that you learn by ear to kind of reverse engineer the the theory behind it, if that makes sense. Um, I kind of feel like a lot of times we go, okay, I'm going to learn a bunch about theory, and then I'm going to be great. Um, but the thing about theory is that theory is only the language we use to describe the art. It's like it's like saying like if you learn. Um, Here's a prime example. I've been to a number of predominantly English speaking countries um, in my travels. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm Canadian, so Canada is a predominantly English speaking country, the US, um, England, lots of places in Europe where it's not, it's not the main language, but it's a big language. Um, just by virtue of knowing English does not necessarily mean it's gonna be easy to communicate with someone. Uh, and, the, and, and so, you know, the idea being if you study English grammar, it doesn't mean that you, when you come to Canada and you hear, you know, like my cousins being like, frick, bud, you're going to take it for a rip? <laughs> like somebody who's just learning English might be like, huh? So just by learning the grammar doesn't mean that you're going to be able to acquire the language. And the same thing is with theory. Just because you understand the theory doesn't mean that it's going to give you the ability to make music. So a lot of times I'll suggest like, okay, what take what you know about theory and learn a song and see if you can justify it using the things that you know. If you can't justify it, then think think harder and see if you can find some little connections. Um, you, you know what I mean? I, I, th I think it's, that's a bit of a vague idea, but um, it's a pretty big um, misconception that if you just learn, if you memorize the circle of fifths, for example, that all of a sudden you're gonna be able to fly on the fretboard, not true. And just because you, you memorize the circle of fifths does not mean that you're going to be able to uh, improvise better. It means that you know all the notes in all 12 keys. That, and, and that's really valuable, um, but it's also not enough information to write a song necessarily. And lots of people write amazing music without knowing any of that shit. So it, it, if, if you think about theory as a tool to archive the things that you know and the things that you like and problem solve your way through things that you don't know and you don't understand, then, you, then you're, I think you're on, you're on the right path. Um, all, of my, all of my favorite musicians, players, composers, whatever, are all monsters in their own right and all of them possess various varying degrees of uh, musical understanding. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm yakking. You guys are asking great questions. I'm having a blast. Um, do you use the open chord possibilities that open tuning gives, like the fifth fret, five zero zero, five zero zero? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For sure, super, super great voicings. Do you use high action? Yeah, high-ish action, still low enough that I can, you know, I can still play. Um, but not not so crazy that it's impossible. So it's it's kind of it's a balance between playing fretted and playing slide. <laughs> Mike Carbone in the house. Mark, 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 mark. Check it out. Uh, love you, buddy. Um, secondary dominant is so cool. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Minnie. Uh, yeah, secondary dominant, super cool way to get around. Fun, fun way. Even even if you're playing diatonically, um, that's a pretty common thing to do. Like if you're playing, so I'm just going C major, D minor, 
E7, which is not diatonic, but I'm using it as a secondary dominant to get to the sixth chord, which is A minor. And then I could go A major, which will get me to the two minor. Secondary dominant of that. And I could go to D major, which is the secondary dominant of G, which is the actual dominant of C. I'm such a nerd. Uh, what else here? Is that secondary dominant like in better now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I go. I call this re rehearsal tempo. So that's all diatonic. And then I think it goes, but I'm better now somehow. Oh, I'm not a tune. But I sleep a moment. Yes, yeah, secondary dominant to the sixth chord. Good ears. Dave, good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Joey uses pretty low action at the nut. Oh, thanks, Alex. Alex knows way more about what I'm doing than uh, than I do. Uh, low action at the nut, like any other standard electric, electric setup, high-ish at the 12. There you go. Thanks, Alex. So I guess that means that I have a decent amount of relief in the neck and the bridge is kind of high, so it's high-ish. Um, is Portugal on the list for you soon? I would love to come to Portugal. I'm probably not going anywhere anytime soon, uh, thanks to this pesky uh, virus. But as soon as it's safe to travel, we'll be coming back to Europe and man, I would love to come to Portugal. So if you have any suggestions for venues or festivals, uh, promoters, tell them that me and the Brothers Landreth want to come. Uh, how do you find other ways to avoid typical progressions chords? I've heard some Motown sounds that songs that don't modulate. So I guess singer melody, uh, singer melody helps a lot. I mean, you know what? I predominantly I live in a very diatonic world, meaning I don't really leave the key often what i really like to do nowadays is change keys so i'll keep the progression relatively the same but modulate to a different key or modulate to a different key and then work in some substitutions but for the most part like the ideas are kind of the same um my suggestion would be just really follow your ear um what if you're working on a new song what does the what does the song want um you know, do, does the do the chord changes match the the mood of the song? And I went through a really big phase where I was listening nonstop to Jacob Collier and and watching all of his his videos of all the crazy stuff that he knows and that he's into. But the thing that I really found really beautiful about his approach is like take all this knowledge about music and you can you can forget it because really to me it's just about creating colors. And so does the song want to go to a dark place? If it does, then I'm going to choose something dark. Either, you know, maybe that means a minor chord. Maybe that mean, means moving in fourths. Um, he's really big on um, moving through the cycle of fourths or the cycle of fifths, basic, you know, and of course I'm massively para uh, paraphrasing. And and uh, uh, yeah, I'm not even close to scratching the surface of, of his music, but uh, you know, I've heard him talk about circle of fourths being dark and the circle of fifths being bright. So if he wants things to brighten up, he's going to move through the circle of fifths. And if he wants things to darken up, he'll move through the circle of fourths. And I've, I found that really um, useful as well. So um, follow your ear though, is the, is the main point in that. And, and ask yourself questions. Is this, is this properly reflecting um, what I'm trying to convey in terms of content of my song? If my song is sad, are the chords sad enough? Do I deliberately want, to make the chords sound happy in contrast with the sad lyric, you know, things like that. Just, just ask questions and don't be afraid to take risks, follow an idea. If it's a bad idea, it's okay. You probably learned something from it. Somebody says, what is your cat's name? This is Rory the cat. She's 14 years old and she's my best friend. <laughs> um, Jacob Collier is ridiculous. Yes, he is. He is a literal superhero. Come to Europe or come to Italy. Yes. Uh, again, as soon as it's safe, I am there. Secondary dominant when you modulate it up a tritone and better now. Oh, yes. Yes. That uh, I think that's probably what you were talking about, Minnie. Not not the chorus, but yes, that and that is exactly it. We 
went from C to F sharp. Mm. And, and the, my idea in that was like, I want this to be Disney AF. I want this to be. A whole new world. Wrong, I sang in the wrong key, but you know what I mean. You know what I'm trying to say. Do you compose or improvise the solo you did on the pedal show thing with Andy Timms? No, that was just improvised. That was, uh, um, I think, the second or third take, because we were taking video. So I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to be editing a million things. So um, I just was like, I'm going to play through this a couple times so I have a good idea. And then the third pass is the one I'm going to send them. And thankfully, I, I like the third pass, so it worked out. Um, yeah. What other questions? Is there anything you guys want to know about? Anything I can talk about? Um, we didn't really talk a ton about slide. I kind of got um, sidetracked. Uh, hmm. Slide tip for the day. Somebody said slide tip for the day. Um, what would the slide tip for the day be? Practice your major scales. That would be, uh, yeah, practice your major scales. You know, things like that. Um, ever do standard tuning slide? I, I don't really. Um, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just so invested in this tuning, so. Uh, I, I know lots and lots and lots of people who play uh, play great slide and standard tuning. Um, and it, I think it probably has more to do with the fact that I'm just not as comfortable in standard tuning anymore. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, if you're asking if I think it's a good idea, I'm for it. Go for it. Do it. But uh, not, I don't personally do it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Maybe some behind the slide stuff. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so behind the slide, um, is really, uh, it, it's really just a technique thing. There's, n there's nothing super elaborate about it other than getting the technique right. And, um, so for me, uh, if you want to start experimenting with this, I, I would say jack your action up a little bit because it can be pretty discouraging if you're trying to do these kind of things with a very, a very fast setup, um, if, if you don't really want to muck with your guitars too much, take it up to the 12th fret or higher because usually you have a little bit of, um, uh, you have a little bit more action up there. And, and and practice something simple like, you know, in if you're in open tuning, for me, stick to that, that root position triad and walk down a major scale uh, where you're going. So this is all 12th, 12th fret. Look at that. It's in tune, Alex. How happy is that? Uh, uh, so I'm going five, four, three, two, one. So all of the chord tones are going to be played with a slide, and all of the uh, non-chord tones are going to be played fretted. So I'm going uh, in terms of frets: twelve, ten, twelve, ten, twelve. And then once you kind of feel like you can get that off the fretboard um, without making a whole lot of noise or or um, being too terribly frustrating, then you could do things like little sequences. So, I went down from five to five, so I went down the octave. Um, and then the other thing that I do is like arpeggios. Oops. So where I'm, again, I'm fretting, I'm, I'm mixing fretting and slide. That's a, that's a bit of more of an advanced kind of move. Um, especially as you get closer to the nut, it gets trickier. So um, trying to play notes, in, if I'm trying to play this as a second inversion major triad, C major, so I'm going to play the, 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 the note that's closest to the body because I play with the slide on my pinky. If I played on, on my third finger or my second finger, maybe I would aim for that, for the, for the root in the middle, but because it's on my pinky, I, I, aim, I aim for the, the note that's closest to the body. <laughs> That stuff so things like that those are really good exercises but then the other the other thing that I kind of and the other way that I really use the behind the slide stuff is to kind of help um, 
clean up some of my quicker lines because I, I, I really wanted to be able to play like kind of chromaticism bop lines with the slide. But I, I could only really do it at slower tempos. Um, and the second that things got kind of quicker, it got really, really messy. And I just like didn't really matter what I practiced or how I practiced. I just couldn't really um, couldn't really get it there. And it's definitely possible because people do it. I mean, if you've ever listened to Speedy West, who is an old um, lap steel player like Western Swing, that dude flies. Um, but uh, I just couldn't really get it together. So for me, it was about kind of kind of balancing eighth notes. <laughs> things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost, it's almost like note for note where it's going slide, fret, slide, fret, slide, fret. So that could be something that you could experiment with too. Oops. Things like that where you're going down scales. The other thing in, in open tuning is scales don't really line up quite as nicely as, um, they do in standard tuning. So, so taking taking scales in, in chunks, in smaller chunks, um, is uh, definitely worth checking out. So, you know, I, I, I'll look at, instead of kind of trying to go, okay, how can I play this? So it's like. I mean, obviously it's doable, but it's not always the most comfortable, especially if you're in a closed position where you're not using open strings. Um, so, I mean, certain things are unavoidable, like this, this big jump between the E string and the A string, you know, there's nothing you can do about that, but, um, taking chunks, I don't know, that's, that's definitely something to, um, to check out. Somebody, oh, Scott, great question. Would you recommend others start with their glide on their pinky ring finger or does it matter? I really don't think it matters. Um, I, I play on my pinky because Sonny Landreth played on his finger on his pinky. When I started listening to Derek Trucks, I tried to play on my third finger and it, I, I could just never get comfy because the, the first time I put a slide on um, and tried to learn slide, it, I was learning Sonny Licks and he plays on his pinky. So I played on my pinky. So that was just kind of um, that's just kind of where I landed. Bonnie Raitt, who's hands down one of my favorite slide players, plays on her middle finger. Um, Obviously, Derek on his third finger. Another one of my favorite slide players, a guy named Kevin Bright, who's from Toronto, who also I used to have a residency at the Orbit Room, RIP. Um, he plays on his third finger. Um, Brett Garsid, if you guys know who that is, he's an Australian shredder guy who's also a brilliant slide player, does the coolest shit with a slide. He plays with it on his first finger. So it really, really doesn't matter. It just It's, it's kind of comfort for me. Um, I, I developed a lot of my technique, my especially the behind the slide stuff, off of what Sonny was doing. So <clears throat> naturally, the pinky finger worked out for me, and I just got comfy there. So I would experiment, you know. Um, I use slides made by a company called The Rock Slide um, out in Washington State in the U.S. And um, I have a signature slide with those guys. Fits my finger perfectly. I would say the, the main thing with picking a slide is finding one that fits. Um, Material, like whether you use glass, chrome, uh, I like brass, it's totally preference. Um, you know, brass slides can be a little noisier, but I kind of like that. I like the vibe. Um, when I'm on a recording session, I always have a glass slide because some people are really bothered by the noise. So I'll always have one just in case somebody goes, I like the way it sounds, but what's all that scratching? Yeah, then I'll put a glass slide on and, and that helps kind of mitigate it. It doesn't get rid of it entirely, but... Um, do you ever deal with hand or wrist injuries? Yes, yes, I have had hand or wrist injuries and I had um, uh, a really, really bad problem back in 2014 uh, with my wrist where I couldn't play for longer than like literally 15 or 20 seconds without being in a considerable amount of pain. And I went to a number of different specialists, but I ended up landing on, a, on a, an athletic therapist um, uh, here in Winnipeg named Claude Gauthier. And um, he kind of gave me a once over and I had gone to see a physiotherapist who said that I had, I had this crazy thing that needed some surgery and I, I wanted to get a second opinion. So I went to see a different type of specialist and he said, I bet you I can fix this. 
um, without surgery. Um, it's probably going to hurt really bad, but I can do it. And he actually isolated my wrist problem to my neck and my shoulder and just uh, pretty much came down to the problem being too much guitar playing and not enough other stuff. So I had these really heightened uh, or highly developed um, muscles, like fine motor muscles in my hands and my wrists and my forearms, but like no muscle mass in my shoulders or neck. Um, so it came down to like breaking down some old scar tissue from, uh, from an old shoulder injury and then just, and then just working out a little bit, like nothing crazy, like not bodybuilding, but just going to the gym and lifting some weights and trying to develop a little bit of upper body strength, um, made a massive difference. And, uh, probably within six weeks, I would go sometimes twice a week for very, very intense deep tissue massage. Um, which often wound up with me in tears. It was really, really intense, but it was, it, it just, it worked and I was, I was back on. And I mean, every now and then things get tight again and I'll start to feel some of that stuff creep up. And then, you know, I go and go through and do a bunch of stretches and, you know, try to get back on the routine. And anyway, um, obviously if you have very, very serious issues, you know, uh, do whatever you got to do, but that's what worked for me. Um, and my guy, in his opinion, um, most, most things can be solved, but a lot of times like, you know, carpal tunnel, for example, and of course I'm not a specialist, so I'm just talking based on what I've heard and what I've experienced, but, um, things like carpal tunnel are just people who do the same thing over and over and over and over. And the only way to really fix that is to, is to address the damage and then create some variety. But, um, it worked really well for me. Thank God I'm all right. I can keep playing. Um, Max Decay, man, there's another person you need to follow. That guy is a badass and makes great looking videos, great sounds, and he's a really nice guy. As a total beginner, how to know if a slide fits right? If it's not wobbling around. So if you have something that's too big, it's gonna it's gonna shake around and it's gonna feel like you kind of got to keep your hands together to keep it on. Like my slide fits well enough that when I tip my hand upside down, it's not gonna come off. Um, I have to take it off. I mean, it's not like it's not like oh god go get some dish soap and some butter. I can't get this off, but it's, it's tight. It's not flopping around. Um, how should a slide fit on your finger? Oh, the same thing, Using your, but it stops at the middle knuckle on my ring finger, it completely covers my pinky. I'm thinking it's too big for it. Um, it, yeah, it's on me. I have, I also have small hands. It's, it doesn't get past my second knuckle either. Uh, on my pinky finger, it lives on this knuckle. So like the last the last sort of finger knuckle before it attaches to your hand. Um, and that's kind of how I like it. So that fits. But again, like, you know, um, it's totally preference. So just, just experiment. Um, uh, who else? What else? What brand of strings do you use? <laughs> you silly goose. Uh, I use Stringjoy. I've used Stringjoy for a very long time. I love these guys. They're great people. They make great strings. Um, oh man, I'm sorry. I didn't. I never even addressed this. What what tuning do I use primarily? I primarily use um, an open tuning, uh, Open C, which is the same as Open E and Open D, but it's it's basically tuned to an E chord. Like if you play an E chord and standard tuning strum it, that's my tuning. Um, but I I tune down two full steps on this guitar. Um, I have a couple other guitars that live in open D and open E. Um, but yeah, that's the tuning that I live in pri primarily. The intervals are one, five, one, three, five, one. Sean Watkins, how are you, my friend? Have I been drumming lately? No, I haven't, but I'm about to move into a studio space August 1st, like an actual recording studio. I'll have my own, I'm, I'm, I'm moving into my friend's B room and I'm going to set my drums up and play them nonstop for a month. Look out world. Here I come. Uh, uh, what um, what pedals and amp are you using? I, I use a ton of different pedals. Um, I my amp my amp of choice is a is a two rock Bloomfield, um, and uh, it's I don't know. I, I do also have a pretty big amp collection. I got a bunch of old amps as well. I, I mean, I shouldn't say big. It's not like Joe Bonamassa, but. Um, I've got a couple of old Fenders that I really, really like. I got an old Deluxe, um, two two Deluxes, no reverb, uh, two old Brown Faces, and then uh, 
Uh, my dad has an old Silver Face Super that he lets me use, which I which I also really love. But my my main amp is a two rock, and it's it's my favorite. Um, I have collaborated with a number of pedal builder friends. Um, most recently, uh, Jackson Audio. We made a pedal called the Golden Boy, which is named after the statue on top of the legislative legislative building here in Winnipeg. Um, and it's a bit of a landmark in my hometown, and I I, uh, I absolutely love where I live. So it was it was nice to name it for that. Um, I've also collaborated a number of times with one of my best friends, Zach Broyles, from Mythos, and we've we've uh, we've made a couple of variations on some of his pedals. Um, he was the first. That's my cat, Rory. By the way, hey, I'm I'm working. This is what work looks like for me. Um, uh, he makes a pedal called the Mjolnir, which is um, which is his take on on a Klon Centaur, and uh, he was the first person to send me a pedal in the mail, and uh, the uh, so the the pedal that we did together was a a version of that, which I absolutely love and use all the time. And then uh, we also did a fuzz called the High Road Fuzz, which is a variation on his Golden Fleece Circuit, which is a badass sounding fuzz pedal. Um, yeah, so those are those are the pedals that um, those are the pedals that I. Uh, kind of always have on my board, but you know, I'm always changing fuzzes and delays and stuff. I also really, really, really like Chase Bliss pedals, so I have, I have uh, a ton of those and uh, use those a bunch as well. Um, theory, yes, I do do lessons in standard tuning. Um, as long as you're okay with me making a ton of mistakes while I try to show you stuff. <laughs> uh, my slide tone is always thin. What's a good fix for that? Hmm. Um, I mean, potentially the slide you're using, also the pickup that you're using. Like if you're playing, if you're playing a strat on the bridge pickup with a metal slide, that's probably going to get pretty bitey. Um, something that I do all the time with this guitar, with my strats, whatever, um, is I'll I'll roll the tone knob back quite a bit, like quite a bit. Um, so I mean, this is this is very my sound right now is very clean for the lesson, but um, you know, with dirty sounds, it, it it really 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 turns out nicely. But so this is just this is just bridge pickup, and I'll roll the tone back. And that just kind of helps, you know, if you're hearing any of that really spiky kind of top end that that kind of helps kill that a little bit um but uh yeah i mean i would also look at where your picking is on your right hand like if you're oh and if you're using a pick like if you use a pick with a slide that's just going to be a lot brighter i i kind of use the meat of my fingers most of the time um uh yeah those would be the kind of the first stops for me would be looking at that also looking at how bright you set your amp because if you if you just like a bright sound you may want to find a slide with a uh, made out of a slightly different material you know glass can be um, a nice a nice kind of softer tone I mean it still can be bright as well but it's going to be less bright than say stainless steel like if you use a, a Dunlop one of those smaller Dunlop steel slides those things those things are great because they 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 can fit well on a smaller finger like if you're a pinky or ring finger person um but you may find um that uh it's pretty bright so trying the dunlop also makes a glass slide um so and and they're pretty cheap which is why i'm mentioning them like i i you know if you want to if you want to get a really great slide go look at rock slide if you're just experimenting and you and you don't want to drop 30 40 bucks on a slide you know, go to Guitar Center or Long and McQuaid or or whatever, and and pick up uh, one of those Dunlop slides, and they're they're a good thing to experiment with. Um, have I ever recorded with a Dumbo? Yes, I have. It was awesome, it was super cool. Um, I've played a few Dumbles, and uh, they're 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 crazy. They're really really crazy. I mean, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't spend, you know, eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars on one, uh, because I don't have that kind of cash to burn. Uh, if I did have that kind of money I would probably buy a house instead um, but they are incredibly special <sighs> any suggestions on moving between minor and major or other key changes fluently um, it depends it depends on what key and where you're going um, there are about a hundred million different ways to modulate um, 
I would I would recommend doing something like a secondary dominant for your first kind of thing. So if you're playing in the key of if you're playing in the key of C and you want to go to the key of D, I, I then you could play A7, A7. So that would sound like this. If you wanted to go from C major to C minor, um, you could you could kind of play like an altered five chord. Or another thing that might be kind of neat because um, C major C minor is the relative minor of E flat major. You could pull from tonality from E flat. I mean that's a little softer sounding. It's not as um, it's not as uh, dramatic of a key change, but that that's probably what I would do. I bet you a lot of other people have way better ideas than that, but that's that's kind of the first things that come to my mind. What kind of scales do you do the most? Um, mostly I live in, in sort of a major scale diatonic sort of zones, but I, I, like everybody, I use a lot of minor pentatonics, major pentatonics. I really like the melodic minor scale and the half whole diminished scale. Um, I also really like uh, exploring the harmony generated from those scales. So like melodic minor. I, I, whenever I'm learning a new scale, the first thing I go to is harmonize it. If I'm learning a new idea, I want to try and harmonize it in all the different ways that I can. Um, the half whole diminished scale is super fun for that because the tonic, you don't really even have a tonic in a diminished in a diminished scale. You kind of have like three tonal centers and there are technically three different diminished keys. But if you were to think of sort of like C half whole diminished, which is this. You can, you can, you would have C major, C minor, and also C diminished, and also C half diminished. So, like, just on the tonic alone, you have a lot of options. And then if you move sort of, I think, um, you, I mean, it's not really truly diatonic, but if you move sort of stepwise, you, you choose a spot. So you choose C major, and you move stepwise through to the diminished scale, you're going to get different different harmony than if you started on C minor and move stepwise. So lots, lots of cool sounds in there to explore. Those are the ones that I really like. Hey, Luke Watt, Luke from Australia, where's a good place to start? Approach playing in other keys when in open C. Um, you know, a great, a great thing is, you know, you just bar your finger and you're in a new key. So challenge yourself to go, okay, what does it sound like if I'm, this is, this is what I would play in C. <laughs> What does it sound like to do that in F? You, you have a few options. Or. Or. Um, just, ch just challenge yourself to play in a different key and see what you can't come up with. And if you are having a hard time finding the chord, then go back to the key that you're comfortable with and see if you can reverse engineer that same voicing in your new key. Um, and if it's a really tricky stretch, then see if you can find an inversion that works. Um, you know, explore is kind of my, uh, my, my favorite advice for that. How do you get inspired when you write lyric and do you have any advice for writing lyrics? Oh man, lyrics are the hardest thing for me to write. I have a really hard time writing lyrics. Um, I, um, uh, I do write a lot of lyrics, but it's probably the hardest thing. Like I have no problem coming up with musical ideas but lyrics is definitely the toughest thing for me to do. So yeah, um, uh, but just live your life and try and pull stories from all over the place. And uh, um, when, you're, when you're telling your own story, challenge yourself to be as honest as you can. It's sometimes it's hard to share the really deep, dark personal stuff. Um, but that's, you know, that those are, those are places that you can kind of, um, you can connect with other humans when you when you tell your own story and you tell it in an in an honest way. Then it allows other people to see themselves in your story. You know, um, those are my favorite kind of songs. When I when I when I hear something and I go, I get that. I've been there, and that just instantly endears me to something. So um, that's what I would recommend for that. Any tips for someone who is starting the blues? Man, listen to the Three Kings: Freddie King, Albert King, BB King. That's, that's my advice. 
so obviously there's so many, so many wonderful guitar players, but to me, those, those three, um, those, those three doesn't get much better than that. Um, my cat's name is Rory. I have two cats. The other one's name is Floyd, but, uh, I had to lock him in the bedroom because, uh, he likes to try and snuggle while I'm playing guitar. Uh, what do you think about the guitar market these days? There's a lot of good cheap guitars that deserve a look. And what about upgrading stuff and trying to know the inside of a guitar? That's important. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Lots and lots of great cheap guitars. Um, uh, Supro. Supro makes some cool cheaper guitars. Uh, I'm kind of drawing a black. A uh, blank. Um, oh, Revolta in Nashville. They make some really, really cool cheaper guitars. Um, uh, but definitely like upgrading, up, upgrading your pickups, upgrading your electronics. So like going and finding, especially if you're going to buy a cheaper guitar, like something in the below a thousand dollars range, the best thing I think you could probably do would, would one be a, probably give it a fret job. Um, and, and then the other thing would be upgrade the electronics. So, so put some nice, go and research. Um, there's a bunch of companies, RS, um, RS Guitar, I can't remember the name of the company, but just look up, just go on Google and look up RS Guitar. You'll find they make pots and switches and stuff like that, capacitors. And then also um, VI Pots. Um, also, that's what I have in this guitar. And they made a massive difference. Putting, putting good, good electronics in your instrument is going gonna, is gonna to open up your guitar in ways you didn't imagine. Um, but if you're going to upgrade the electronics and not the pickups, it's probably going to make you realize your pickups sound worse. So, um, and that's not from experience. I'm just guessing that, that uh, if you don't have great pickups in there, nice electronics will probably just illuminate that. Um, so you may want to, if you find a guitar that's cheap that you really, really like, Go out and buy some nice pickups and some nice electronics. That's a good place to start. Um, how do you approach arranging your songs and writing harmony? Uh, it's kind of like, well, write, writing harmony is a different thing because um, it's it's obviously like background harmonies and stuff like that. They they are a they are a function of arrangement. Like you could you can make something more or less exciting based on the the harmony the background arrangements. But it's also a very artful process for me. So like I'm trying to find the right part to sing, but then I'm also trying to sing it in an interesting way that fires me up. Um, so um, that's kind of a tough question to answer with just a just like a one kind of idea. In terms of arranging, it really again comes back to that question, like or asking questions. Where does this want to go? Where does this need to go? Is this too long? Is this too short? Does it need something else? If it needs something else, what is it? Does it need to lift? Does it need to get more exciting and go somewhere or does it need to kind of shut down and kind of get introspective? I'll, I'll, I'll ask questions like that. Um, and, and try to figure out what arrangements need. Also, if you're, if you're in a position where you're making a record and you've got a producer, trust your producer. Um, they're going to, they're going to have a lot of good ideas like that. Um, guys, I got a split pretty soon. Um, so, we're going to wrap this up right away. I'll, I'll keep answering some questions, but um, I really just want to say thank you to everybody who um, who has signed on for this and stuck around. I can't believe there's still 150 of you. That is awesome. I feel like I've just been yammering the whole time. Um, but I really, really appreciate you guys coming down and hanging out with me and asking thoughtful questions. It's just been a blast. I really, really also want to say thank you to Scott and String Joy Strings. Um, they they uh they are really really great friends really good people they make great strings so go out and buy some strings from these guys um i really you know for me when i partner with a company it's it, obviously the product's got to be good but the people have to be good i right? like if you make the greatest thing in the world but you're but you're not nice or you're rude or whatever the string joy guys are just as good as it gets so they uh and they've taken really, really good care of me. So go and buy some strings, all right? Um, I will keep going for another minute or so, uh, and then I'm going to hop off. Have you ever played reggae? I love reggae music, but no, I don't, I don't touch it. I can't, I can't get the feel right. Um, uh, I, have, I have played a few reggae tunes like in, back in my cover band days, but it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, 
Just got a signed golden boy from Jackson, and I just want to say how much I love it. It's primary drive, and MIDI is a godsend. Yes, I'm so glad that you enjoy it. I love mine for the same reason. It, I truly love that pedal. It's not just because my name's on it. Do I produce? Um, I have started to produce. Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of producing. Um, not a ton, but uh, it's it's happening. I'm doing the odd thing. The, the little collaboration that the bros did with Marielle Buckley, I produced that. Um... All right. I think that's it, guys. Thanks so much. I love you all. Um, stay safe out there. We're going to get through this thing. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy time. But, um, man, do I, do I ever miss all of you? Holy mackerel. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get emotional. Um, be safe. Wear your masks. Uh, we all want to get out of this thing. So do your part. Um, yeah, love you all. Take it easy, guys. Be good.